Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zach's. I'm your host, Ben Rains. In this week, we're going to be talking about an up-and-coming Gatorade rival again for, I think, now the third time on this show. But there was some big news last week that we just have to touch on because I think in the long run, it could could have a really big impact on the industry. And then we're going to do a little bit about the future of live sports on streaming platforms and who or what company I think has the best position at the moment to come out on top as the the streaming live sports king in the future. Uh, but, but before we do that, I just want to say, uh, remember, if you have any questions or episode suggestions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com because we always appreciate any feedback from listeners whatsoever. But now let's let's jump right into it. So last week, Coca-Cola and Body Armor announced that they entered into, and now I quote, a definitive agreement which Coca-Cola will acquire a minority ownership stake in Body Armor. And I just want to say that we first talked about Body Armor, I believe, back in April for the first time on this show. And I mentioned that I saw a very easy possibility of Coke buying the company at one point. They have not officially bought the whole company. Uh, so I'm not trying to toot my own horn here, but it seemed it was all too obvious that Coke would just they have so much money this they want they've been trying for decades to compete against Gatorade this company's doing pretty well quickly why not just buy them while they're cheap now instead of 10 years from now so some of you though might be wondering what exactly body armor is so i want to do a little bit of the history of the company and kind of what they what they say is their competitive advantage against Gatorade before we get into a little bit more about the deal so Body Armor launched in 2011 in New York. Its co-founder, chairman, and the principal, the current principal investor is Mike Rapoli. And he has a history of successfully starting beverage companies from scratch. He helped create Vitamin Water and Smart Water, which he sold the Coke back in 2007 for a whopping $4.1 billion dollars. And then a couple years later, he starts Body Armor. Fast forward to now, they already he had a relationship with Coke already. Now Coke is is now the second biggest shareholder or investor in Body Armor. So they say Body Armor says their competitive advantages, and I want to put this out there. I've not had Body Armor. I'm not a big sports drink guy. I don't drink Gatorade or Powerade or anything like that mostly water for me. So I can't say from experience how it tastes, though they're saying that it's uh, it's more electrolytes, less sodium, and they're substituting the less sodium to get you those electrolytes with more potassium. Uh, no artificial coloring or flavors, and they use coconut water. Uh, and then as opposed to Powerade, which Coke actually owns as well, they don't use any high fructose corn syrup or sweetener. So their play is we are a healthier option. That's how the market is changing. People are looking for more healthy options in most things they do. Coke has suffered because of this. The sugary beverage market is kind of on the decline in general. And then also they have quietly amassed a lot of big name athletes, maybe not the biggest names. They don't have the household names like LeBron James or Tom Brady or Steph Curry, but they have landed James Harden, who won most valuable player in the NBA last season. He is pretty famous in the United States as well as China. And then they have multiple time Major League Baseball MVP Mike Trout. At this point, we're recording it. I believe he's still the world number one ranked golfer, Dustin Johnson, Andrew Luck, who at one point was going to be the next huge quarterback in the NFL, had some shoulder problems. Clay Thompson, Anthony Rizzo, Chris Stapps Porzingis, Richard Sherman, some UFC athletes. They actually landed a deal with UFC relatively recently, so that's going to be big for them going forward. And they're also doing promotions with young, other up-and-coming companies, such as Barstool Sports. They're sponsoring their rough and rowdy boxing which is the most ridiculous thing ever if you have a chance to just google it real fast it's it's 
people who are not professional boxers. They all have day jobs. It's often in pretty working class cities. The most recent one was in Youngstown, Ohio, and they just box with no skill whatsoever. So it's just a lot of haymakers. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, so they're, they've kind of done this grassroots movement through social media and just younger athletes and gotten to the point where they've made so much noise that Coke was looking at them. But what I haven't mentioned yet is the biggest athlete on their roster doesn't even play anymore. And that is Kobe Bryant. He is was an early investor in the company back in 2003. He is currently on the board and also acts as the creative director for the company. And if it sounds a little weird and why is Kobe Bryant qualified to do that? He did recently win an Oscar this past year for a short film he created called Dear Basketball. He started a VC fund called Bryant Stiebel in 2013 which was three years before he even retired. So he had he had, had plans post-basketball for a long time. He's even come up with most of their taglines, which are direct shots at Gatorade in their national ad campaigns. The tagline for their kind of end of all the commercials recently has been, thanks Gatorade, we'll take it from here, saying that Gatorade hasn't changed really in the last 40 years. I used to drink Gatorade when I was younger, all I can say is it's very sugary, and I think as young kids grow up with less sugar in their diet, less Coke, just less sugary drinks, that they're going to tend to maybe shy away from Gatorade and Powerade, which to me just tastes way too much like sugar. I don't really know why you necessarily want that while you're playing a sport. But now let's get back to the new deal itself. So part of this deal... Body Armor will have access to Coke's bottling system, which could lead to a wider and perhaps more efficient distribution, which is great for Body Armor. It can get on more shelves. It can get in more stores. And then meanwhile, Coke becomes Body Armor's second largest shareholder. I already mentioned that. Just behind the founder. And it's also surpassing Keurig, Dr. Pepper, uh, which was formerly Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, which had carried Body Armor as an allied brand since early 2013. So Body Armor was last valued at less than $200 million, uh, when Dr. Pepper Snapple grabbed up about a 16% stake in the company between 2015 and 16. Uh, it's now a little bit less than that. And then there was there's talk that Body Armor is going to inform, and this is from a Wall Street Journal report, that once Body Armor made this deal with Coke last week, that they will inform Keurig, Dr. Pepper, their plans to terminate their current distribution agreement and kind of slowly move on from this partnership. Uh, and then the big thing here is there was a caveat in the deal is that it gives Coke the ability in the long run to take full ownership of body armor. Uh, I find that maybe I, I don't know. I don't think that means that the, the owner, the people who have stake in the company now lose their stake or anything like that, but that they could take majority ownership uh, of the company uh, though. There was not any full details of how much the deal was worth but Coke did say that it would position Body Armor as a premium sports drink ahead of Powerade already, which I find absolutely hilarious because Powerade's been around since the early 90s, and it just really hasn't, it's failed to come close to touching Gatorade. So they're saying, we need a change. We're going to do it right away. Uh, which brings me to the market itself. So Gatorade still dominates, grabbing about 75% of the roughly $8 billion U.S. sports drink market. And this is based on a Wall Street Journal uh, report. And to me, that number sounds shocking. $8 billion is spent on Gatorade in the U.S. a year. Uh, I don't know. That just seems crazy to me. And then Powerade was second at around 18%. And then Body Armor, as of 2017, was a distant third at about 3%. So you have Gatorade at 75 Powerade at 18 Body Armor at three, and then all these other companies kind of make up the, the little bit of chunk that's left over. Uh, so Gatorade is still by far the biggest player, but their sales have declined in recent quarters. 
and the company's relatively new CEO. Uh, so sorry. And Powerade has also just, like I said, never done well. And so the com- Coke's new CEO, uh, James Quincy, uh, has really tried to diversify beyond sugary drinks. And that's for a pretty good reason. Coke's revenues were down 8% in their most recent quarter. And then shares of Coke over the last 10 years are up only about 70%, which falls well short of the S&P 500's 135% climb. So as you can see, uh, it's just not doing as well. And then even more recently, over the last five years, they're up just around 1%. So Coke has been pretty much sideways for five years. They need to do something. And this is their most recent push, buying a big chunk of body armor. Uh, And then a little bit of a forward look at what body armor could do. Uh, Their revenues are expected to hit $400 million this year after doing about $235 million in sales in 2017. And then one of the big numbers you might have seen last week if you read any of these ESPN articles or Wall Street Journal articles about the deal was that... uh, So Kobe Bryant's initial $6 million investment for what is reported to be about 10% of the company a few years back is now, based on ESPN reports, worth $200 million. So good for Kobe. He turned $6 million into $200 million uh, pretty quickly. Uh, So good for him. Uh, And then going forward, what seems to be a good thing for both Coke and Body Armor is that Kobe is a god in China. Basketball is king in China, and Kobe is up there with Michael Jordan uh, in terms of popularity still today, even though he's not playing, in that Coke obviously has a distribution network in China, which Body Armor would have had to spend a lot of money to do themselves. So I think it'll be a really nice pairing between the two of them as Coke tries to grow Body Armor's brand, not only in the United States, but around the world, and especially in the second largest economy in the world. And then a little quote that I thought was hilarious from the founder of Body Armor, comparing himself relatively favorably to some big companies, and this is from a Wall Street Journal interview, Uh, he said, to me, Gatorade is blockbuster video, and Body Armor is Netflix. (laughs) Uh, So you have to evolve. You're not going to be around. So if you don't evolve, you're not going to be around much longer. So big, big boast from the guy who started Body Armor saying, we're Netflix. We're going to be huge. Blockbuster is now pretty much non-existent, even though if you look back, Blockbuster had a chance to buy Netflix before it even started streaming when it was still just a little tiny DVD mailing business. And man, are they kicking themselves for that? Uh, but who knows? If they bought them, maybe we don't even get the Netflix that we have today. But speaking of Netflix, I want to move on to the next part of the episode, which I want to focus on the future of live streaming sports. It's something I've talked about a lot on this show, but I talk about it because it's so relevant for every sports fan. It's a This is a multi-billion dollar industry with just so many people and companies that are directly tied to what's going on. And as most of you know, the content world is just changing rapidly. And eventually, whether it's in five years or 10 years, streaming is where pretty much everyone's going to be watching their live television. And that's why I want to talk about where I think or what company I think is going to or has positioned in themselves and what company will do the best going forward. Uh, So I want to start with a little tidbit that I thought was interesting. That So last week, at the end of last week, Twitter landed another new live sports partnership. They've amassed a bunch recently. And this time it's for high school football. They're partnering with Adidas to bring you Friday Night Lights on Twitter. Uh, And in general, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, YouTube... Uh, All these places are really trying to push more into live sports because it's one of the last things that advertisers care about when you have everyone going to uh, non-ad-supported platforms such as Amazon Prime and Netflix. But 
for me, it seems like Amazon has by far supplanted itself as the st- streaming sports service to Envy, and they, I think, in my opinion, will be the company that does it best going forward. Simply because, I mean, for a lot of reasons, but the most simple thing is if you think about how people use Twitter, it's most often on their phones, uh, just scrolling through it. Facebook has is now hugely a mobile first platform as well whereas amazon prime for the most part is sitting it sitting in your house and watching it on television and i know that people can say streaming sports on your phone is the future because that everything the future is always on your phone or your mobile device but i really just don't see long-term sports fans not watching sports on a television and sitting down because that's how it's just more enjoyable to consume sports that way. So I don't really see how Twitter, unless they somehow just convince their user experience or convert their user experience to be more friendly for a television setting where someone's sitting on a couch and I somehow flip on Twitter on my streaming uh, TV. It just, I don't see long term how they're going to be a huge live sports. Uh, dominant player. Uh, and now I want to get into a little bit more of the details of what's going on with Amazon. And obviously they're doing a lot more things that are really driving their business aside from this sports push. But what they have done is very is very interesting and it really sets them up for what I think, as I've said now a couple times, going to be a great future of live sports. So they signed this past year, a, a two-year extension with the NFL for Thursday Night Football uh, for their Prime subscribers. And just a little side note, so for Prime subscribers, there's about 100 million. Jeff Bezos, uh, it's the first time he ever said it. This was in April, and it's still the only time they've given any numbers out because Amazon's oddly just kind of hush-hush about a lot of things that are going on there except the $50 billion they make every quarter. Uh so he said they had just more than 100 million people paying for Prime globally, and this was in April. So it's likely gone up since then. So that's how many people would be able to access these Thursday night football games, uh, theoretically. Uh, and the one-year deal comes after, or the two-year deal comes after they signed a one-year deal this past season for $50 million for 10 Thursday night football games. And that was way more than the $10 million that Twitter paid the year before for Thursday night football as well. But clearly the NFL did not find that partnership to be worthwhile because Twitter and YouTube and Facebook all were bidding for those rights last year again. And Amazon has come out on top. Uh, Wall Street Journal estimates that this new deal for Amazon was it worth about 30% more than their first deal. So it pegs at about $65 million a year. Uh, the interesting thing, though, here in what I'll say is going forward, Amazon's going to have to eventually, and all these companies are, either absorb companies that already are in the broadcast industry or roll out their own broadcast teams and crews and all of that. Because right now, what Amazon's going to do is they're just going to stream Fox's coverage of Thursday Night Football. So Thursday Night Football will still be on regular television. It'll be on Fox. Fox paid $3.3 billion for a five-year Thursday Night Football deal, and this is on top of the billions they already pay for their regular slate of Sunday games. Uh, So, yeah, that's something they definitely have to work on going forward. And then what I also found interesting, what I didn't know the first time I read about this deal, is that Amazon and the NFL have agreed to make Thursday Night Football free to stream on Twitch, which is uh, Amazon's video, like widely popular video game platform that they uh, paid about $1.1 billion for in 2014. And the idea here is relatively simple. They're going to try to experiment with stuff. That's if you go on Twitch, it is sometimes even for the G League, which is the NBA's developmental league, Amazon currently has a partnership with them to stream games on Twitch, and they will have 
you're you're allowed to watch a stream where it's not the NBA's broadcast crew or anything like that. It could just be a fan broadcasting the game or just experimenting with what's going to work long term because the NFL for as much as people say it's it's a dying sport and I've talked about how in general football is going to eventually decline uh just based on kind of demographic trends, but football is not coming to an end anytime soon and certainly not the NFL. So they need to know what's going to work in the long term, especially with the younger consumers who have grown up streaming. Uh, So Twitch is where they're going to experiment with this, uh, just anything they can try uh, this upcoming season. Uh, And then just for reference, uh, in total last year, Uh, Prime Video's live streaming for Thursday Night Football drew 18 million total viewers over 11 games. Uh, So that's really not that much. Uh, The average NFL game gets about 15 million on regular broadcast television. So over 11 games, getting 18 is not great. But the ratings don't matter at this point, and the money doesn't matter at this point. Certainly doesn't matter to Amazon. Uh, they made $53 billion in the second quarter. So them paying whatever $65 million a year for this means literally nothing at all. Uh, And that was up 40%, which is just crazy. Uh, And then there's some, there's some other stuff that they're more quietly doing. Uh, I've mentioned this before is that they won the exclusive rights to 20 Premier League games in the UK, which is a very big deal. Uh, There was talk at the time when these rights were coming up for grabs that they would maybe buy and spend a bunch of money and buy all of the Premier League rights in the UK. That did not happen. They got a slate of pretty important holiday games, including Boxing Day. And if you're not a big soccer fan or a Premier League fan, it would kind of be like if a UK-based company came in and bought the exclusive broadcast rights to uh, Thanksgiving Day football. just And you had to only watch that on Amazon Prime. That would be really crazy, and that is the equivalent of what's happening. Or if someone came in over the top and paid more than ESPN and Turner for Christmas Day NBA games, and you just had to watch it on this random service that you might not have at all. Uh, but this is part of their larger plan, because quietly last season they filmed a documentary series of the team that ended up being the champs of England. That was Manchester City. They won the Premier League last year. They had the most ever points for a season, 100, the most ever goals, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, So this past Friday, the premiered uh, All or Nothing with Manchester City, And there was a huge red carpet, or I actually think it was a blue carpet premiere in Manchester. It was a big deal. Every one of the Manchester City players was promoting it on uh, social media. The team was really promoting it. It was a big, big deal. And this is just part of their push into soccer, which is by far the most popular sport in the world. And then also, it's a part of a broader push into sports programming. They, this uh, All or Nothing series, it's All or Nothing and then fill in the team name. So it started a few years back with the Arizona Cardinals where they filmed the Cardinals throughout the entire season. Similar to Hard Knocks, but instead of just training camp, it's the whole season and it comes out after the season, which is exactly what they did for Manchester City. Then they did one for the LA Rams, the Dallas Cowboys, and then they also have one for the Michigan Wolverines football team, and then the New Zealand All Blacks, which is their hugely popular and pretty world-famous rugby team. And all of this is just to say that they've pushed into sports in a big way where Netflix isn't touching it. They have, I mean, you can watch some documentaries on Uh, sports documentaries on Netflix, but they have said that they are not getting into live sports whatsoever, uh, whereas Amazon is all for it. They have their Amazon movies, their indie-style movies with some big A-list actors. Uh, They have their TV shows, and then they have some aggregation of movies and TV shows as well, but they're all in on live sports, and I don't really see this changing and going forward, people are already watching Amazon on their televisions as 
opposed to Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and that's why I think that Amazon, among other things, that they're just doing very well, uh, that live sports is going to be something that they dominate going forward because streaming sports is the wave of the future. Don't know exactly when it's going to flip. I don't think it's going to happen even this next NFL uh, cycle where the rights get come up in the next couple of years. I, I think CBS and Fox and ESPN will pay for broadcast rights where it won't be allowed to be streamed, but you could maybe see Amazon kind of get maybe a Sunday game every week or the opportunity to simulcast Monday Night Football or Sunday Night Football, something like that going forward. And it wouldn't shock me if the NBA is one of the first teams to do a bigger Amazon Prime deal because they've been kind of on the cutting edge of all of this stuff with Amazon already on Twitch and all of that. Uh, but I could go on about this for way too long. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. <laughs>